Hi boys and girls, it's Mrs. Guy. I'm here at the famous Humor Sir Apothecary shop. I'm in the garden out back. Now, apothecary is an old fashioned word for doctor. Now, today we would go to see an optometrist or eye doctor if we had a problem with our eyes. Or if we had a problem with our feet, we would go to a, a podiatrist or foot doctor. But back in the day, an apothecary used to take care of all your needs. And they would treat everyone from children to adults. In fact, Hugh Mercer, who used to work at this very site, treated George Washington's mother, Mary Washington. And this took place over 200 years ago. And you can come here to downtown Fredericksburg on Caroline Street to see the apothecary shop in the same building that it used to be in. So you could come in with me and we're gonna see what kind of things that we're gonna see inside. As you can see, Dr. has a good supply of leeches, so he will be able to accommodate you. You see, leeches are not as painful as lancets are. They attach, they'll take an ounce of blood, and then they drop right off. But you continue to ooze blood for a number of hours afterwards, so you get an additional benefit from them. You got my finger. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> As I'm sure you are well aware, when Mr. Mercer is his own surgeon, dentist, apothecary, and physician all in one. But don't you find that to be the commonality here in the colonies in 1774? Most of the various businesses are kept together. Whereas back home in England, they're kept separate thanks to the guild system. Here in America, however, there's much less restrictions about what a doctor can and can't do. The only restriction here in Virginia really is how much they're able to charge you. Otherwise, if you have the money available, you can open up a shop, claim to be a doctor, and start treating patients. Is that the sir? Hi, we're upstairs at the Hugh Mercer Apothecary Shop, and I'm right outside the door to what was the powder room. Now, you might have heard the term powder room referring to bathrooms today. But back in the day, when men and women would wear wigs, that was the fashion, they would actually use these doors and they would stick their head through the door and inside there would be a tray to catch any excess powder and they would powder their wigs. Hence the term powder room. And the reason they would do this is so that they wouldn't get all that powder on their clothes. Now you may have also noticed these very large, beautiful brown jars up on the counter. These are only advertisements and decorations. We don't use this for storage as the paint is on the inside and we don't want to risk damaging it by stirring anything inside. But this denotes powdered blue bob, which makes for a wonderful purge for the yellow fever. Whereas the other jar refers to powdered bark, specifically Peruvian bark. Now, Peruvian bark is one of the doctor's most effective cures. You might know it better by the more modern term of quinine can be used to cure malaria, along with other inflammatory fevers. Unfortunately, it is extremely bitter to the taste, so oftentimes the doctor will make it into a pill. That way you're able to keep it down without any sort of trouble. Okay. You may find yourself having to stay at a tavern or inn that's not very well kept, not very well clean. It may be infested by bed bugs, lice, fleas, etc. <laughs> Just sprinkle some honey oil onto the bed sheets. It will repel the bugs and let you have a good night's rest. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> but the wealthier ladies and gentlemen in town prefer their pills to be coated with silver leaf. It gives an extra elegance and fanciness to the medicine they're taking and helps it stay dry and preserved for longer. Now, I've never done this, but you do have to be careful about who is making the pills. Some of the other assistants have been known to sometimes put a bit too much silver leaf on the pills. They have a tendency to pass right through you, undigested. Oh. If that is ever the case, the doctor just recommends boxing them off and giving them another go. <laughs> <to dissolve eventually. laughs> Consider it a reusable pill. <laughs> As you know, we don't really bathe very often. Typically, we only bathe in the warm summer months when it's warm enough for us to go down to the local river for a good bath. But, if you ever do find yourself being beset by scabies, the doctor can make a wonderful cure using some shavings of these wax, mix them with some olive oil and some spermaceti. This is the waxy substance from the head of a sperm whale. We get it from the New England colonies up north. He'll mix this all together and melt it down into a paste. 
He'll melt it down into a paste using his spirit lamp. This will simply be filled up with a little bit of alcohol into the bowl, light the wick on fire, and it will create a small mobile flame that he can carry with him in order to be able to melt anything down. Then once it's all melted down, he'll just add in a final touch of a little bit of sulfur. Now, thanks to the sulfur, you will smell a bit like rotten eggs, but everyone else in town smells the same way, so no one's going to notice. Now, if you're one of the strange sorts of people who don't like blisters for some strange reason, you could instead ask for some snake root. This is a plant that the local natives use to treat snake bites, though I'm not sure if it has any effectiveness there. But the doctor will let it soak in wine for several nights before giving that to you to drink. Once you drink it, you'll begin sweating profusely out of every pair of your body. It's simply wonderful stuff. Saffron, I'm sure you're all well familiar with thanks to its culinary use, but it does have its medicinal uses as well. As you know, saffron can be used to dye a food yellow. It can make for a yellow skin if you boil it down, and according to the doctrine of signatures, that like will cure like, a yellow skin caxon must cure yellow jaundice, which makes the skin turn yellow. If you start turning yellow, drink something yellow. That's what make you feel better. <laughs> makes perfect sense. <laughs> now, if you ever have someone who has a bleeding cut or a bleeding scrape, pack the moon with cobwebs. It will staunch the blood flow. You may want to pick out the bugs and spiders first, but it's entirely up to you. Marrow. I'm sure you're all well familiar with marrow thanks to its biblical significance, but it does have its use here in the colonies as well. Oftentimes in spring balls of we find our gums cracking, expanding, and bleeding, our teeth loosening and falling out. That's the scurvy, you see. Well, if you take some myrrh, grind it up into a fine powder, swish your mouth with it, it will tighten up your gums, it will stop the bleeding, and it will save you a few teeth you may still have left. Cases such as that, the doctor would recommend a tea or tonic of sassafras. You might know it better as root beer. Several teas of this will eventually thin out the blood and provide some relief. Mm -hmm. Though you will have to drink a large amount of it over a large period of time in order to have any sort of noticeable effect. In fact, it sometimes takes up to a couple of months. In fact, it almost seems to coincide entirely with just murmur of leather, but again, who knows. <laughs> in any case, it's fairly pleasant to drink, so... You can just drink it for your own leisure instead of any sort of medicinal purpose. And if you are still feeling very tired and listless and need your blood thinned out, you can just instead come in to see the doctor for a good springtime bleeding. Oh. When you have a boil, putrid wound, or need to be bled of a great deal of blood, the doctor will take his cupping glass, heat it up by dropping into it a piece of burning cloth or paper, or he'll hold it over a candle. When it's very hot, he presses it firmly over the desired area. As it cools, it actually creates a vacuum. So it's going to pull out the boil, pus in the infection, it'll actually bring up chest congestion, or it'll bring the blood to the surface for a faster bleeding. As you may know, last February, a number of people in town actually caught the smallpox. It's the doctors most insisted that we all be inoculated. See, first we'll be removed from society for three weeks, so as to prevent the spread of the disease. You'll then be given a number of doses of jollop or mercury, so as to cleanse your body inwardly. Then with this instrument, he'll make two small cuts on your arm. And with a flat side, he'll scrape pus from live smallpox pustules. Those unfortunates who still have the smallpox provide the pus, which he'll then place into the cuts he's made. You'll get a slight case of the smallpox, which you'll recover, usually. <laughs> and then you never have to worry about the smallpox again. However, if you get it naturally, there is a great chance you'll die of it. <laughs> However, if you live too far out in the country to come in and see the doctor, what you can do is you can find yourself a willow tree, cut off some bark, take the inner bark and chew on it, or brew up a decoction if you have the time and drink it. That'll help ease the pain. See, doctor says it contains something called salicylic acid, which is what you may call aspirin. So here we have a desk very much like Dr. Mercer would have used. And here we have some old fashioned eyeglasses. which are probably not quite as good as the glasses that we would get today. When I do see the doctor, he's left his traveling case on the desk, which means he must be about town. You see, he often goes to your home to treat you, but you may not appreciate it, for he charges you twice as much to treat you at home as he does for an office visit. Five shillings for an office visit, 10 shillings to treat you at home. You know, if you cannot be carried to the doctor, you no doubt will try to treat yourself. 
You ladies know that have your own home remedies for your family's minor ailments, one from your mother and grandmother. And you gentlemen, the wealthy plantation owners that you are, know that have your, pardon me, know that have medical books in your libraries at home. You read the same books doctor has, I shouldn't wonder. And if you bleed yourself, you will save two shillings to expense. <laughs> About 70 to 75 percent of those are still used in our modern pills today. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then um, leeches are actually still used in many hospitals even here in America. Um, even at Walter Reed, they're using leeches. 